So uh, there are office hours today, is that correct? Yeah. So uh, are we ready to talk to you? Um, so let's see, we're talking about the Wigner function, um, something that Wigner defined a long time ago, the 1930s, but sort of, sort of fell through the cracks in the way most people are taught quantum mechanics, so that we could be taught it this in our undergraduate courses, and I teach it when I teach at a senior level quantum mechanics. It's not this way, but you know, there's something, you know, when you know, oh, that, you know I'm mean, but not that mean, uh, uh, something we should understand about the nature of, uh, you know, what's different in quantum mechanics versus high mechanics. Anyway, formally the way we define it, the, the, the bigger function uh, for uh, you know a particle moving in with one degree of freedom or one mode of the uh, magnetic field is given by the trace of the state with the symmetric delta function at the position in phase space that we are interested in it. Okay, and then we have these complexified versions of it and all this notation that we have to do. Um, so we have these operators we call T, which are the 2D Fourier transform of the displacement operator. Okay. Uh, so some important properties we saw about the bigger function, it's a real function, but it's not always a positive number. So this, for that reason, we call this phase space representation a quasi probability distribution. It has some of the properties of a, pro of a probability distribution, but not all. In particular, there's some notion of negative probability that distinguishes quantum statistical observation from classical statistical physics. But, um, so it, it's, it's actually bounded. Actually, we'll see, I, I mean, it's, it's actually quite straightforward once you know what to think of it. To show that it, these are the bounds. I'll explain that maybe at the end of the lecture. It goes between minus two over pi and two over pi. Um, and importantly, the bigger function gives me the correct marginal distributions. So if I marginalize the joint probability distribution to get the probability of one or the other variable or some subset thereof, it gives me the right. Okay, so that's a share is the property that we expect. So it will tell me the outcomes. If I'm interested in the outcomes of, say, a homodyne measurement along some quadrature, the Wigner function gives me the right probability distribution, uh, no matter what that quadrature is. Okay, that is uniquely true for the Wigner function. We'll talk about that more about other kinds of phase space representations today. Um, right. So there is a, a whole bunch of other formalism. Um, importantly, the these sets of operators, the displacement operators and the delta functions, are complete basis of operators. Say any operator can be expanded as a superposition of these operators weighted by an appropriate coefficient. And um, in particular, if I look at those coefficients, as to say I want to write the uh, representation of any operator as a superposition of symmetric delta functions, then that representation, that phase space representation of that operator is known as the Weyl symbol. Okay? And the Wigner function is just the Weyl symbol of the density matrix with a factor of one over pi so that it's properly normalized, okay? So maybe I should write that down as one of the properties over here, which is that the trace of rho equals one implies that if I integrate over phase space, I get one with that choice of measure, okay? Um, right, and 
So that gives us a way of looking at representations of things like operator inner products in terms of integrals over phase space. Um, in the same way we think about, you know, the inner the inner product between two vectors in Hilbert space can be thought of as an integral between the two wave functions. We can think about this in a kind of but that, that superoperator version of that, um, where you know these are now functions that represent the operators. And so, for example, and importantly, when we are interested in say the expectation value of some operator, which we know is given by the trace of the operator with the density matrix or this, the density operator, we can think about that as the inner product between those two operators, which has this representation in terms of the biosymbols. And that's just the weighting of the function over phase space. So in, in, uh, if I go back to um, X and P, it looks like classical statmec. Classical statmec, we have some probability distribution on phase space, which might evolve according to the Liouville equation. And uh, if we want to then ask what is the expected value of some observable, which is a function of phase space, we would just average that, that um, function over the probability distribution. So it looks uh, formally like classical statistical physics with the exception that this is not an honest to God probability distribution, except when it is, right? Because we saw examples of bigger functions. If we had something like a coherence state, Bigger function for this guy uh, looked like that, or equivalently in I'm sorry over over alpha in X and P, uh, it's um, uh, this guy. Which is a Gaussian centered at this position in phase space. With a variance in X and P, which is equal or equal to a half. So this is an honest to God probability distribution, which tells me about the probability of measuring any quadrature. And it's it's rotationally invariant around x naught. Or, and similarly, if I had a squeeze state, a squeeze coherent state, then this thing would Also be Gaussian, but with a variance that need not be equal to a half, but would be a minimum uncertainty product, right? So delta or sigma, whatever I want to call this, times that. So there are quasi-probability distributions which are honest-to-God probability distributions. Okay. We'll come back um, to discuss that a little bit more, what, what the implications for that mean. Uh,
and in what sense a squeeze state is classical versus non classical, and why do we care? Uh, rather than, yay, it's non classical. Um, uh, but there are other states, for example, if I look at a Fox state, where the bigger function is not uh, always, except for the vacuum for the ground state, is not generally a positive bigger function. And let's remind myself uh, of that normalization here. Um, So this thing can be highly negative. Right. So, um, very good. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. I'm trying to think about how you like, might transform a Wigner function, Wigner function to another Wigner function for like unitaries. Like, do, do we have some, like if unitary operations are like special from like a quantum information perspective, because they preserve some feature of the system. Yeah. On what you're looking at. What, do we have something here for like, do unitaries preserve the po overall positivity of the bigger function? Like yeah, like that? I mean, of course, yeah. for unitary operators, I mean, the bigger function is just a representation of, say, the state, yeah. right? Uh, if it's, for example, if it's a pure state, uh, then we know that the a unitary transformation preserves the norm of the state, which is to say that that is saying something about preserving the inner pro, you know, that representation, the bigger function would just re would respect that preservation. Uh, but that's really just all there is to it. It's not that there's something more about the positive, it, it can't change the positivity, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, uh, but it, it, the main thing about what a unitary a transformation does is that it preserves the norm, and that would say it would preserve the norm of the bigger function. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So for the bigger functions, like the state, right? Is there yeah. like a like a phasing operator for the bigger? Oh, uh, that's an interesting that's question. Right. Yes. So the bigger function is the representation of the state, it is the vial symbol of the state. But I can have the vial symbol for any observable, like a creation annihilation operator. What will be more important to us, as we will see, is when the action of the, say, the creation annihilation operator on a state in Hilbert space, we think about algebraically, but we can also think about it in the Wigner vial representation. And as we will see in a, some few weeks, the action of the, say, the creation and annihilation operator might look like a derivative with respect to alpha or alpha star. In the same way that you know that the momentum operator in the position representation looks like a derivative with respect to x. So the way in which operators act on states in Hilbert space has a phase space representation that looks like a differential operators. We'll see that later. So if I have a general bigger function and I want like time and it's not time evolving and I want to time evolve it, but I have a, like a different vial symbol for that and apply them together. Yeah, well in the same way if I wanted to know how the wave function evolved, which is the position representation, I would use the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which means that the Hamiltonian, which is the generator of time translation, looks like you know the derivative with respect to x squared and whatnot. And we'll see a little bit later, the time evolution of the bigger function will be a partial differential equation which tells me how, in the same way that, you know, it's a version of what's called the Liouville equation. So it, it's a way of evolving 
the um, uh, it's a way of evolving the function on phase space as a PDE in X and P. But we'll get there. Yeah. Is there only one state for each linear function? Yes, but it's a it's a it's a unique decomposition because I can invert. I can say the state, right? Let's write it in super operator notation. Is this? This is the bio symbol, which is the bigger function. So when I take this off, this says uh, the state is the weighting of that. So given the bigger function, I can find the state. In the same way that if I thought about, you know, a state, I can think about that, um, you know, there's the wave function times x. Or said another way, Uh, it's a little bit more complicated here because I'm going to have to have it. Anyway, I just leave it there. I see. Yeah. yeah. So is there, um, since it, it's like a unique decomposition, yeah. is there a way if somebody gives me a big pair function, what are ways that I can tell if it's a decomposition of an actual Yeah, that's a good question. Well, first of all, it has to be. To go all the way back to row. So, you know, the bigger function has to be able the, what, what we said a few, some things we said is that the square of the Wigner function has to be have to be normalizable in a particular way. It has to be bounded in a particular way. It has to satisfy the uncertainty principle. So there are not every function is a bona fide state because you give me an arbitrary function in here. I do this integral. This is not going to be a positive operator. So. There is a, I need to ensure that this is a, a honest guy and, and you know, the, the litmus tests that we talked about are the ones. Let's continue because there's a lot more I want to say and I'm, I'd love to have more discussion. We can do them offline. All right, so. Um, now, one of the other things we discussed briefly uh, last lecture uh, was that um, the Wigner function is a way, if I have a operator O, which is some function of X and P, um, and I want to know what its vial symbol is as a function of X and P, what that is equal to is the trace of this function with the symmetric delta function. And thus, because it is the trace with the symmetric delta function, it gives me <coughs> the following relation. I can, oops, sorry. Uh, what do I mean by this function f sub s? f sub s is the symmetrically ordered version which is to say that for example Suppose O was equal to X times P. That's not symmetric in X and P. It's not a permission, but I don't care. Okay? I don't need to be permission to find a bio symbol. But this is equal to X times P plus P times X over 2. Uh, plus I over 2. How can we see that? Well, 
if I commute this, then I have to add that the commutator of P with X is minus I, and then I'll get the same thing. Okay. Now, it's kind of a mess to generate it, but if that's true, so what I claim is that the vial symbol for this thing is going to be equal to x times p plus i over 2. Because I just substitute wherever I see an x hat, I substitute the number x. Wherever I see a p hat, I substitute the number p. Those commute, they're just numbers, and I get this. So. It's one way of finding the vial symbol if you could do if you could do the symmetry. You don't have to do the trace. You just symmetrically order it and then make the substitution of x and p. Notice that this function is not real, which is not surprising because this was not permission. So it's okay if that vial symbol is a complex number. And generally speaking, the expectation value of an observable will be equal to the symmetrically ordered version of the thing with the Wigner function. So the Wigner function is a natural for calculating symmetrically ordered expectation values. If I have a symmetrically ordered expectation value, it looks like the class, I just substitute whatever that thing is, and I get the same. So the Wigner function gives me symmetrically ordered. And this would be true also for A and A dagger. So if I, ha if I thought about O as some other function of A and A dagger, which, you know, because if it's a function of X and P, let me make it clear this was my F as the function. Then this is also a, um, symmetrically ordered a different whatever that function is g evaluated at a equals alpha and a dagger equals alpha star so if i are interested in symmetrically ordered expectation values the bigger function is the way to go they are the things that come into homodyne detection as well review in a moment, okay? So, but we're not always interested in symmetrically ordered correlation functions or x integrals. You remember when we were thinking about the theory of photon counting, what was really important was normally ordered correlation functions in the a dagger. So, there are other correlation functions or expectation values we're interested for different kinds of measurements. And what that's telling us is that the phase space representations are not unique, and we would use different ones in different contexts. Okay? So, phase space representation. is intimately related to operator ordering. Because, and it's that operator ordering that's somehow saying something about the quantumness. I mean, the fact that things don't commute is somehow really important to what makes quantum different from classical. It's telling us something that I can't, you know, the, the back action, the disturbance, what I can know at the same time. Uh, with perfect certainty. So let's talk about this business of operator order. So let me say I have some uh, operator, which is a function of A and A dagger. Okay. E.g., the number operator. Now, whatever this function is, whatever this thing is, it's some operator. And I can expand it in a power series in A and A dagger. But I have to, there are different power series I can write down depending on the order, whether I put the A's on the left and the A dagger's on the right, or the A dagger's on the right and the A's on the left, or in some symmetric order. So 
this operator I might have, for example, as what I'm going to call an ordering I'm going to call plus one. This is a set of coefficients. These are C numbers, as was sometimes called in ancient times. Um, or I might write it in symmetric order, which means all permutations of this in symmetric, symmetrically. Or I might write this in anti-normal order. So this is what we call normal order. This is what we call symmetric order. And this is what we call anti-normal order. Now, I want to emphasize the following fact. All these are equal. It's just that the coefficients are different. So for example, this operator is the same thing as In this guy, in for, I, a, for the symmetric order, I have C00 zero zero is equal to a half, and C11 one one and uh, is equal to, they're all equal to a half, right? N equals one, N equals one. And then, you know, for the other guy, for minus one, I have this guy is equal to one, and C zero is minus one. So there's different sets of coefficients. I mean, I don't really care what this is. I don't, it's not very important what these are. The main point I want to emphasize is that the same operator can be written in different operator orders. This, they're all the number operator. I've just written them in different ordering of the operators using the commutation relations, okay? So these all are the same number operator. They just have different, different Taylor series expansions depending on the operator order, okay? They're all the same. They're all the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And with that, I can thus define the following thing. The S ordered phase space representation. of s as a function of alpha and alpha star is just the power series, the particular power series I have for that particular s ordering where I set a dagger to alpha star and 
and A to alpha. Is that clear? I want you to absorb that for one moment where S is equal to either plus one, zero, or minus one for normal, symmetric, or anti-normal. Would it be alpha to be M? Yeah, it would be. Thank you. Okay. Is that clear to everyone? I want you to absorb that for just two minutes. These are, this is the same operator, but these are three different functions generally. They're three different representations of the same operator. Just like we can have the position or momentum representation, the Wigner representation, I can have different phase space representations depending on this power series. <coughs> because these coefficients are different, this will be a different function depending on the operator ordering I choose. Okay? Now, beware. Deutsch is stubborn. <laughs> you were the other direction. <laughs> Why do I mean by that? Well, my definition of this is the opposite of everybody. Everybody chooses this with the with this with the, the S as being the, the opposite sign. For a reason I'll explain why you might choose the other notation, but this is the right one because I say so. Uh, and that's just, you know, how it is. You're stuck. But beware. It drove my student Carpatini crazy. And I said, like, no, it's this is I think, no, no, no. You're right, Karthik. It is the opposite of what everyone does. But I, the way, what everyone does is stupid. Sorry, because uh, this is how this is how it's defined. Okay, there's a, I won't explain, but you'll see that most in every other textbook in the original paper by Glauber, it's defined the, with the with the if it's symmetrically ordered. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, the S's are the minus S. Okay. All right. All right, so how would I find <coughs> this? I mean, it seems like you know, this is a pretty tough thing to do to first, you know, I, I, to take the operator, write it as a power series, find these coefficients, and then substitute in. That seems like a pretty ridiculous thing to do. But there is a, more, a better way, and a way that will connect to what we've been talking about. Uh, oh. So what I claim is that, and this is why it's the opposite, that the S ordered uh, uh, representation is equal to the trace of the operator with the minus S ordered some delta function. This is why the people would typically define it the other way, because you're, why would you trace it with minus s? Why wouldn't you just then call that O of minus s? But there's a method to my madness. I am somewhat mad. This is, it makes sense why you would do it this way, because there's a duality relation that I'll explain in a moment, okay? But this is, what I claim is that this is the same, sorry, as that. Okay? That's that. If I trace the observable with the minus, this guy with the minus sign, then I get this. I will get the right operator order product. Let's check it. Okay? So, T of plus one is delta of a dagger minus alpha star, delta a minus alpha is pi. T zero is pi t minus one. So 
So this is the normally ordered delta function. This is the symmetrically ordered delta. And this is the anti-normally ordered delta. Everyone see that? Okay. And I claim that I can get, if I want to get the normally ordered representation, I trace with the anti-normally ordered delta function. If I want to get the anti-normally ordered representation, I trace with the normally ordered delta function. And for the symmetric, I trace with the symmetric, okay? Which is the bio representation. So we, we did the bio thing, that gave us the right thing. That's what we just already showed that. But let's look at these other guys. Firstly, let's just do an aside. If I look at this anti-normally ordered delta function with the pi in there, I'm going to play a trick. <coughs> and I'm going to substitute in a resolution of the identity in terms of coherent states. It's a nice thing to do because the coherent state is an eigenvector of the A, the annihilation operator. And the bra gives me that, right? So I can do that. Everyone see that? And so when I do that, what I get is the integral, the pi's cancel. And I get the integral over beta. I get delta of uh, beta minus alpha, delta beta star minus alpha star uh, times beta, beta, beta. I just did those eigenvectors. Right? And then this is just the two dimensional delta function, beta minus alpha. Um, and that uh, is and factors of pi and factors of 2 in this thing drive me nuts. But, okay, this integral gives me the delta function, which is, oh, oh no, it's good. Oh, yeah, it's right. This is a projector onto a coherent state. Now, Mosin, you may remember you had asked, is the we said that the delta function of the operator x minus x was the projector on x, and p hat minus p was the projector on p. And is the delta function complex the projector on the coherent state? And the answer is yes <coughs> for the anti-normally ordered case. The anti-normally ordered delta function happens to be the projector onto a coherent state. God, who knew? It's not an orthogonal projector. Yeah, they're true. They're not orthogonal in, uh, in that sense. But they're, co they're orthogonal to the dual. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, so, let's check then. What I claim is that the um, uh, the normally ordered representation of an operator is what I get when I try do that when I trace the operator with the anti-normally ordered delta function with the pi. But that, we just said, is a projector onto a coherent state. But that is just equal to that. Does this give me the right power series? Let's check. I can plug in uh, the normally ordered guy. This is equal to 
the sum over n and m, I'm not going to write the limits, so you'll forgive me, right, that's just substituting in that first power series, which I could say, because that's one of the power series. And what is this? This is an eigenvector of a gives me alpha to the m, and this gives me alpha star to the n. Correct. Spam. Always spam. Right? <laughs> so I got the right thing. Yay. representation by tracing with the anti-normally ordered delta function. And in this particular case, that is obtained as this expectation value. Okay. What about the symmetrical ordered case we've already done? What about the anti-normally ordered case? So let's look at this, which is the trace of O with the normally ordered delta function, which is the trace of O times pi delta A dagger uh, It's a little bit more complicated to do. I can't, if I stick in the delta function, the, the thing here, that seems bad. I could either, I could stick it in here or I can stick it in here. Let's put it over there. Let's put in the, the same completeness relation. I'm going to get the integral over beta, the trace of O with delta A dagger minus alpha, I'm going to have a delta then beta minus alpha beta beta. Okay. I canceled the pi's, I took the integral outside the trace, I replaced this by the eigenvalue. Right? Okay, that seems like I'm stuck. Let's see. Uh, I need to rearrange some things. There's a trace. Yeah. This this let's not do that step first. Let's let's put this guy on the other side. That seems good. That I can do. Uh, one of these, yeah, this should be an office star. Resolution of the identity in between one of the deltas and O, then it will work out, right? 
then it could be. Uh, uh, yeah, put, 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 it, put it in here. Put, yeah, put it in there. Okay, that seems like a good idea. Let's, let's put it there. Okay. Then, oh, yes, yes. Okay. So that will then equal the anti normally ordered guy. will equal the trace of this guy, O, beta, beta, integral over beta. And then I'm going to get a, a delta function of beta star minus alpha star, right? But I'm still stuck here because when I take the trace, this is on the wrong side. shove in the anti-normally ordered guy. That'll help. So the anti-normally ordered guy uh, I'm going to have to come back. It's, I, 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 I kind of see how this works, but it, it might take me a little bit longer. this out for myself in a, in a different way. There's another way to show me the notes, but that's a much more complicated way. And I don't want to do that. It's a, it's a total mess. But this works. I promise you. Sorry. Come back next time. Okay. So, this is our definition. And um, what else can I, what do I want to say about it? So the, what we have is three representations now. If I look at the density operator, then they have, there are certain particular names that these things have. If I look at the normally ordered representation is called the p function. If I look at the symmetrically ordered version, it's called the Wigner function. And if I look at the anti-normally ordered, I'm sorry, this is anti-normally ordered. This is the Q function, also known as the Husini representation. These are three different representations that have come up separately. They were separately thought about and invented, but later understood to be different operator ordering representations of the same thing. Okay? This guy we've been talking about for the last number of lectures. What about the Husimi representation? Well, the Husimi representation we just said was equal to the um, trace of rho with the anti-normally ordered delta function.
the Husimi representation is, and for a pure state, this is just this. The Husimi function is what you might have guessed is a nice way of defining a probability distribution on phase space. You just look at the probability of an overlap with a coherent state centered at a particular place in phase space. This is an honest to God probability distribution. It's everywhere positive. So the Huey-Simi function is a probability distribution. What is it the probability distribution of? Well, if we look at this, it's the trace of rho with this. This object forms one of a complete set of positive operators. If I were to look at the integral over all of these guys, which I might call P sub alpha, this is a resolution of the identity. So this probability is a probability density, is associated with a particular measurement, because this set of positive operators form a resolution of the identity. This is a POVM, and these are the probability densities associated with those particular outcomes. But if this is a POVM, that means that there is some measurement I can do whose outcome is the complex number alpha. What measurement am I doing which has as its measurement outcome. I always thought that the measurement outcomes have to be real numbers. Yeah, well, of course, this is really an x and a p at the same time. This is a measurement of x and p at the same time where when I say x and p, what I mean is a coherent state centered at the position x and p in phase space. And the measurement that allows me to measure x and p at the same time, this POVM, is what we call heterodyne. In a heterodyne measurement, you're measuring both amplitude and phase, or the two quadratures at the same time. Now, you're never going to be able to have a state which is definitely, there's a price you pay for that, which is that you're not, there's no precise thing that has both an X and P at the same time. I can only talk about a bubble around that. So this is not a, a projective measurement. These are not orthogonal projectors like they are for X and P. But I can certainly measure X and P at the same time no one should tell you that you can't do that. You can do it. You do it every day. You just have to pay the price that you're never going to be able, you're, there's going to be a noisier measurement. Okay? And so the Q function could be understood as the outputs I get if I do a heterodyne measurement. The Wigner function is the thing that's associated with homodyne because it gives me the right marginals and give me the probability distribution if I measure x or p. I'm going to get the right, mar this will not marginalize to the right probability distribution of x and p. Another p, sorry p, you got lots of, there's the Glauber p. We remember the Glauber p was related something to do with, you know, statistical measure, mixtures over coherent states, right? And so what's that about? Well, for that purpose, we need to talk about 
uh, this business of duality, you know, this, if I wanted to find the normally ordered, I trace with the anti-normally ordered. If I want to find the anti-normally ordered, I trace with the normally ordered. There's this plus and minus in Y. Way too stubborn. Um, and that's the following. So here's a the sort of last important piece of formalism we have to look at, which is the duality of representation. So, um, firstly, I can define the S order delta function as the Fourier transform of the S ordered plane waves or displacement operators. Remember, D beta is either the beta alpha dagger minus beta star alpha. That's symmetrically ordered. Okay. What is the normally ordered guy? Which, by the way, yeah. before I do that, let's remind ourselves from Baker Campbell how here, how is Baker? No, 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 no. Baker Campbell House Law, right? Theorem that I can separate this out and write this as e to the minus beta squared over two e to the beta So the normally ordered guy is what I have, which is an, also sometimes written with, this is, this is really confusing. So let me explain what I'm trying to say. This symbol, the colon, means close your eyes, forget about the fact that these guys don't commute, and put all the guys on the left that are A daggers and all the guys on the right. So that's what I mean by D plus one. In the same way that we had T plus one, I close my eyes and I, right? That's what I mean by the, this is different than doing the commutators because this operator sure don't equal that operator. D plus one does not equal D zero, nor does it equal D minus one. However, what we do have thus is the following, that the S ordered thing is equal to e to the s beta squared over 2 or d alpha. Okay. So what we see here is thus the following. We have the following completeness relation.
and orthogonality relation. Notice that these different delta functions, this goes back to Cole's point about the um, projectors on coherent states, which were the antinomial delta functions, not being or an orthogonal set of operators. But they are orthogonal to their dual, which are the normally ordered delta functions. So the, order, the normally ordered delta functions are orthogonal to the antinomial ordered and vice versa. That's why this might, where you put the minus s is a matter of choice, but I'm right, <laughs> okay? Um, and so with that said, we have also this relation of completeness. have the following. If I have, for example, the state rho, which I'll write a super operator form, everyone see that? But what is this? This is the S-ordered representation of rho. But that over pi is the what we're calling the quasi-probability distribution. So, putting it all together, what I have is rho is equal to the integral over phase space, the s-ordered representation, which I'm calling w sub s, the s-ordered quality probability distribution times that delta function. That's why I like it this way. There's no one minus it, so the same thing. So, for example, if, if s is minus s is equal to 1, Never mind, brain just froze for a moment. This is correct. Thank God. Right? We just said this 
was the projector onto a career in state. What's the anti-normally ordered representation of the state? P, Q, or W? P. As we said, the P function is the function that says, oh, the state might be thought of as a statistical mixture of coherent states. It is the same thing as the anti-normally ordered representation of the state, but it's the thing that actually, when it's positive, gives me the sense that this is a classical state. Note that if I were to ask what is the expectation value of a normally ordered How do I find a normally ordered expectation value? I average it with the anti-normally ordered representation. Which is the p-function. Which is what I expect because that's the same thing as that when I take that trace. Okay. So the P function is the thing that is useful when I'm thinking about calculating normally ordered expectation values. Because if I calculate the normally ordered expectation values, I average it as if it were a classical probability distribution. If this can't be expressed in terms of an honest to God probability distribution, then this expectation value doesn't have a classical interpretation. But what we have is that the p-function normally ordered correlations w-function symmetrically ordered. Now, Q function anti-normally ordered, but there's no, there's no way that that gives us, those moments have no meaning. The normally ordered correlation ones, you remember, was were the Glauber photon counting theory, as we discussed last semester. When we're doing, when we're thinking about correlations between direct photon counts, the statistics of that are determined by the p-function. Whereas if I'm doing uh, homodyne detection, then it's the Wigner function that I care about. Whereas if I'm doing heterodyne, it's the q-function I care about. So, to summarize some of that, <coughs> um, if I look at the expectation value of some observable, given what we have over there, that's the trace of rho with A, which is equal to the integral over phase space, the S-ordered representation by the trace of A with the S-ordered delta function, 
right? But what is that? That's the minus s ordered representation of the observable. So this is equal to the integral over phase space minus s. Notice this duality between these two different orders. So for example, if I wanted to know about the normally ordered observable, I trace that with the anti, or I average that with the anti-normally re representation, normally ordered with P, anti-normally ordered with Q, symmetrically ordered with Vigner. They go those two directions. Okay. Good. Now, I want to, we're going to, I had hoped to tie this up today, but I got distracted. We'll finish up tomorrow. But I want to say one more thing as a kind of foreshadow of the last bit is do these representations exist? If I come back to this board, who says this is a convergent power series? I just wrote it down, but who says that that actually converges to anything meaningful? That's, it doesn't, is the answer, not always. For, uh, certainly, for, yeah, for some yes, some no. Come back to that. So, um, how would we know? Well, one thing I want to just remind ourselves of the following. So recall, we said that the Wigner function was the Fourier transform in the phase space of something we call the characteristic function. Right? where the characteristic function was the overlap with the displacement operator. Kind of the interface in, the, in, in terms of things. Now, the D of S of, so this would say that the S order thing is related to the S order guy related to the S ordered guy is related to S ordered guy. Right? But now with the minus sign. Because I have this crazy habit. And D of S, we said, was E to the S beta squared over 2. Right. So if we look at this, we start to get some hints that things can get crazy. Because when S is positive 1, this thing blows up, which means it'll be the Fourier transform may not converge unless the function falls off faster than this. So depending on the operator ordering, you have different levels of fine-grained and coarse-grainedness that you can tolerate and still have a well-defined function. And that's gonna be the last piece of this whole story that's gonna be able to tell us something about the different levels of classicalness or non-classicalness, which is kind of related to this Gaussian coarse-grained the level of Gaussian coarse grain is sort of going to tell us something about that. So we'll complete that story next time. And I will get my stupid anti-delta function right now here. Oh, well. <laughs> no, no, I'll do it. All right. Oh, I forgot to wear, I brought this cool Happy Fat Tuesday when I was in my, and I, I had my, all my beads and everything. I was going to forget. <laughs> Damn.
i'll bring them next time.